Good afternoon, and welcome to the campus conversation. This is the fifth in a series of six conversations over the course of this year. Today's talk, What's Going On and Why, Civil Liberties and the Trump Administration, No Civil Liberties Battle Ever Stays Won, will be followed next Thursday, March 16th at noon, also here in Student Center East, uh, by an open forum. Today, we are honored to have with us Professor Susan Herman, the President of the Board of Directors of the American Civil Liberties Union and a member of the faculty of Brooklyn Law School. Susan Herman was elected President of the ACLU in October 2008 after having served on the Board of Directors of the ACLU for 20 years, including as a member of the Executive Committee and as General Counsel for 10 years. Please come on in. There are a lot of seats uh, in the front up here. At Brooklyn Law School, Professor Herman holds chair as Centennial Professor of Law and teaches courses in constitutional law, criminal law, criminal procedure, as well as seminars on law and literature and terrorism and civil liberties. She has written numerous articles and several books, including the award-winning book, Taking Liberties, The War on Terror and the Erosion of American Democracy, published by Oxford. Professor Herman received her BA from Barnard College and her law degree from NYU Law School. She's also a, a dear friend of mine uh, and a mentor. Today she's going to speak for about 30 minutes and then take questions from the audience. So please join me in a warm UIC welcome for Susan Herman. Well, thank you, Susan, for that very nice introduction, and um, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So what I thought we could do with our time, you know, there's so much happening, you know, like the Trump administration, a lot of radical change. So I thought since your theme is what's happening, I thought I could start with uh, some of what's happening, starting with the headline item of changes in immigration policy, and then kind of work my way back to ACLU history of all, to help talk about no civil liberties battle ever remains won. And for and since this is a school, I thought it was very appropriate to be talking about not just what's happening now, but how it connects up with some of the things that have happened in the past. So always a good place to start, as we were just discussing, is with a story. So instead of just telling you that thousands of people have been affected by these radical changes in immigration policy, I'll start by telling you about one person, Hamid Darwish. Now, some of you may have heard about Hamid because he became the title plaintiff in the ACLU's lawsuit against the new Muslim ban. And uh, that lawsuit was the uh, occasion where the first court issued an injunction against the, the travel ban. So here's what happened to Hamid Darwish. He is Iraqi. Uh, he was a translator who worked with the American troops. Now what that meant as a translator working with the American troops, that meant when the troops were out there with their body armor, Hamid was out there wearing his baseball cap and, and his sweatshirt because he didn't get body armor. So you know, putting himself at great risk, he was also credited with saving the lives of a number of members of the American military. Well, after, after uh, the war, after things settled down in Iraq some, uh, Hamid was finding that his wife and one of his children were getting a lot of you know, blowback from the fact that his family was seen as pro, uh, so pro-American. And so they made the difficult decision that they'd like to emigrate to the United States. So Hamid applied for a special visa because he had done special service for the United States and spent about two years in the vetting process with the interviews and the forms and the meetings, etc. Finally was granted his special visa and found himself in the air when the travel ban of January 27th became effective. So what happened to Hamid when he arrived in the United States, he had been so looking forward to this, saying very complimentary things about Donald Trump and he was so looking forward to coming to the United States. He was detained at JFK Airport for 19 hours uh, before he was finally released due to the lawsuit. So um, this is the executive order, the original one that was issued on January 27th, which in addition to other things that it did, prohibited anybody from any one of the seven countries listed, one of which was Iraq, from entering the United States, even if they had a visa, even if they were a legal permanent resident who had just gone abroad and was trying to return back. So now I want to switch gears and tell you about a different person, one of the many wonderful people on the ACLU staff, who happened to get involved with Hamid Darwish's case. 
Uh, this is Lincoln Gullert, who as you see is the Deputy Director of the ACLU's Immigrants' Rights Project, one of our about 16 different areas where we work. Lee had been working for the ACLU for about 25 years, so he was prepared for what was about to come up. But here's the timeline, you know, imagine this. So the executive order is issued, I think it was 5 p.m. on the 27th when it was announced. Between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m., Lee and some other lawyers at the ACLU and with some of our allies had a conference call to talk about the contents of the order and what was there that they were concerned about, what did they think was unconstitutional, what was their plan for challenging the executive order. So they get off the phone at 9, 9 p.m. Friday night, and about 10 p.m. Friday night, they start getting texts that this order is not just going to apply in the future, prospectively, but it's actually applying to people who are just landing at JFK Airport who are being detained, including Hamid Darwish. So the lawyers get back on the phone, and we have a lot of allies, including a former ACLU staffer who was running an immigration clinic at Yale Law School. And they stay up all night, and they write papers, they write to your left, is the complaint in Darwish versus Trump, which was filed, you know, I've just told you that you know, 10, uh, 10 p.m. on Friday night is when they first found out about Hamid Darwish and who knows how many other people who are being detained at airports, not just in New York, but around the country. 6 a.m. Saturday morning, they filed those papers. And look at that, they look like real papers. Right? You know, they just literally stayed up all night getting the papers together. So the result was on Saturday night, uh, a judge in the Eastern District of New York in Brooklyn, Ann Donnelly, issued the order which was the first uh, restraint, just basically saying you can't do that all of a sudden. You know, these people have visas. And, and her ruling was that uh, she thought it was extremely likely that the travel ban was going to be struck down as a denial of due process and possibly more. So on a sort of a personal front, uh, this is a, a kind of social media story. When Lee and the other lawyers went to the Eastern District to do their argument about the uh, 6, 7 p.m. on Saturday night, there were 50 or so people in front of the courthouse because somebody had put it on their Facebook page or Twitter. By the time they emerged with their order, there were a 1,000 people outside the courthouse. So this is Lee with Anthony Romero, who's the executive director of the ACLU. And this is from a little video that somebody just made on their cell phone. And uh, this video has now been seen by 8 million people. You know, part of the reason why all of a sudden I don't have to probably tell you what the ACLU is. You know, it used to be we would go places and people would say, the ACLU, what's that? Well, you know, that's not the question we're getting so much. Now we're getting more, you know, how can I help? So I, I don't know if you can see the sign in the background. The crowd was chanting and it was just a pretty amazing experience. Now what this is meant for Lee is he's become a media hero. Here he is on Samantha B. <laughs> Lee, for the first time in his life, has been forced to tweet. <laughs> he's had to try to put had thousands of followers immediately. But I think the message here is that Lee was not the only person involved, in which he would be the first to tell you. So in addition to the other lawyers at the ACLU and the other allies we've had in many other organizations filing a number of suits, um, we've had a number of groups that have been supportive, not just for legal talent, but for wanting to stand up as the plaintiffs in the lawsuit. So the ACLU right now has had 14 different cases pending against the travel ban of January 27th, which as you probably know has now been replaced with a different version of the travel ban. One of those lawsuits, which will continue, is in Maryland. It was brought by the ACLU of Maryland and the National ACLU. And it's a challenge to the new cap on the number of refugees who have been being admitted to the country each year. Under Obama, the maximum number had been 110,000 refugees overall, not just from those seven countries. But uh, now the number is 50,000. So there are some questions about the validity of that order. If you wanted to look up the, law case, the lawsuit, you could. But you'll see the name plaintiffs here are the International Refugee Assistance Project, which represents all sorts of refugees, and HIAS, H-I-A-S. Anyone know what HIAS stands for? OK, interestingly, it's the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Um, this is an organization that was started in 1881 to help Jews who were trying to flee the pogroms in Russia and other places. They were very active as well um, around World War II, trying to get people who were refugees from Europe and from Hitler into the country. And Mark Hetfield, the CEO, uh, has said in a blog post that he wrote for the ACLU on occasion of you know, becoming a plaintiff in this lawsuit, he said their organization had never filed a lawsuit before. But you see, he said, we cannot remain silent as Muslim refugees are turned away just for being Muslim, just as we could not stand by idly when the US turned away Jewish refugees fleeing Germany during the 1930s and 1940s. So 
One of the things that I think is pretty amazing of what's happening in the country now, and this I relate very much to what the ACLU does and our mission, is that people are standing up for each other. So the people at the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society really see the similarities between what's happening to Muslim refugees from Syria and many other places now, and what was in their past. Um, a few other examples on that theme. Just on this Friday night, I was at the Japanese American Bar Association, um, where they also, they regard themselves as a civil rights organization, and remembering what happened to their parents and grandparents during World War II, when their parents were forced to evacuate their homes, um, they were very interested in standing with the, the Muslims now. And Fred Kuramatsu, who I'll talk about in a few minutes, who was one of the people who had to evacuate his home during World War II, this is him with his daughter Karen. Uh, Fred died a few years back, but his daughter Karen is involved in the Kuramatsu Center. And this is a picture of the amicus brief, the friend of the court brief, that the Korematsu Center filed in the case that was in Washington State, that Washington State brought against the Trump administration challenging the travel ban. And again, the idea was, you know, this is our history, you know, Japanese American history. And we believe that what you know, they said, that what's happening today is very similar to what happened during World War II. It's a kind of guilt by association on the assumption that because we're afraid that there may be a few people in this group that might be dangerous and wanting to do us harm, we are willing to upend the lives of thousands of people. In the case of the uh, evacuation orders during World War II, it was hundreds of over 100,000 Japanese Americans who were completely loyal. Um, and I, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But I want to get on to now, not just about the Muslim travel ban, but here's a really interesting story, I think, which I find very moving on the other side. So this is Linda Sarsour, who had been the director of the um, Amer Arab American Association of New York. She's now was just a Muslim activist, and she's involved with this man, Tariq El Masidi, who is the founder of a group called Ce Celebrate Mercy. And they are Muslim activists and fundraisers. And one of their recent campaigns, which they put on Launch Good, there's a picture of the page, was to raise money to, among Muslims to repair the Jewish cemetery in St. Louis that had been vandalized. You know, part of this whole you know, wave of intolerance that's sweeping the country. So I also think that's really remarkable, you know, the Muslims standing up and saying, you know, we stand with the Jews you know, whose cemetery is being vandalized because we recognize that you know, if it's happening to them, it can happen to us. If it's happening to us, it can happen to them. So that to me is very much what the ACLU stands for. There are all sorts of great groups that you know, defend the rights of one particular group of people who do you know, racial justice or women's rights. But the idea of the ACLU, according to our founders, especially Roger Baldwin, was to defend everybody, to have people banding together to represent other people's rights. And the idea is that I should be just as outraged if somebody else's right to equality or justice or freedom is being denied as I am when my own rights are being denied, because it is all connected. And I see people nodding. Interesting, too, that uh, Baldwin's co-founder, Crystal Eastman, is a woman. We had women right at the very beginning. And part of that is because the ACLU was founded in 1920. Now, if you think about what else was happening in 1920, that was the year that women finally got the vote. So a lot of the people involved in the founding of the ACLU were people who had come from the women's suffrage movement, including Jeanette Rankin, who was the first woman in Congress. She was from Montana. And she got the job of reading out the text of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote in Congress because she was the first woman. Jane Addams, a little familiar to those of you in Chicago, right? There were a lot of social workers as well as lawyers involved in the founding of the ACLU. And people who came from different places. Roger Baldwin had been a conscientious objector. He didn't believe in World War I at all. Helen Keller, you see here. The founders of the ACLU were progressives. They were you know, um, people in the labor movement. There were the women's suffrage people. There were Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, progressives, communists, just you know, people across the board. And the basic idea was this whole idea of other people's rights. So this is a sort of an organizational chart of what we do today. And you can see that under the headings of liberty, democracy, and equality and justice, we about cover the waterfront. We do a lot of different kinds of rights because to us, it's just all connected. So um, I want to tell you two things about prototypical ACLU issues, which go back to 1920 when the ACLU was founded. Because here's where we can begin to look at the pendulum swings of history and how it is that civil liberties battles are won but don't stay won. 
So what was happening in 1920 when the ACLU was founded with the Palmer Raids? Now, how many of you have heard of the Palmer Raids? Okay, some, but it's not really taught that much in school anymore. But as you can see from the headline here, this is an example, this is only one example, of where there were raids where 4,500 people were arrested. Now, what was happening in 1920 is that the terrorists of the day were anarchists, and some anarchists had planted a bomb near the home of Attorney General Mitchell Palmer. And he didn't like that, not surprisingly. The bomb went off and he felt very endangered. So the way he reacted, because he had a lot of power as being the Attorney General, and because he had a new FBI director named J. Edgar Hoover, who was willing to help, was they went out and they arrested over 6,000 both immigrants, mostly from Eastern Europe, from Russia, you know, there were Italian anarchists, and they arrested all sorts of labor activists and labor organizers, and a whole lot of people who they thought might be involved with the anarchists, and therefore might be dangerous, and so they arrested all sorts of people with no particular suspicion, it was this kind of guilt by association, and deported, you know, many, many hundreds of people were just deported, so their lives again were upended because there was this fear if there are a few you know, bad apples in the bunch, we better just get rid of everybody. So one of the first actions that there is Mitchell Palmer and some of the people were waiting in deportation. So one of the first actions that the ACLU took was to issue a report on the Palmer raids because initially the Palmer raids had been extremely popular with the public. The Washington Post uh, wrote a story in which they said, this is no time for hair splitting about rights. You know, this is dangerous. We have to get rid of these dangerous people. But over time, the American people really changed their minds as they started to see more about the individual stories and started to see that this whole fear of you know, the other, in this case, you know, the people who might be from Russia or Eastern Europe, was really overblown and really irrational. There was no reason to think that because there were a few anarchists that everybody in this group was dangerous enough to exclude. Sound familiar? Okay, so there's one example, fighting the Palmer raids. There was a very brave federal judge in Boston who issued habeas corpus um, relief to some of the people who were uh, being detained at the time under often harsh conditions. And gradually, you know, people kind of got past that. Um, during World War II, uh, Fred Korematsu, that's a picture of what he looked like at the time, challenged the evacuation orders. And I think as today, there was very little evidence that Japanese Americans living on the West Coast presented any danger. And historians, especially if you look, there's a book by Peter Irons called Justice at War, where he talks about the evidence that was presented to the Supreme Court, that there were some Japanese Americans who might have been a fifth column on the West Coast, and therefore it was necessary to move them away from the West Coast so that they wouldn't endanger Americans because they might be loyal to the enemy. Um, Irons tells us, and I think not the only historian to tell us, that that um, evidence was really exaggerated, that what the Supreme Court was told was extremely overinflated. And you probably have heard the same about the order today. There is no evidence that anybody from now, one of these now six countries being excluded has ever committed an act of terrorism resulting in the death of any American in the last 40 years. There are you know, some people who have been charged with various crimes, but you know, there's really no reason to think that these countries are different or that the people who come from Syria and you know, Somalia, etc., are pose a danger to us. So the thinking is all this dragnet kind of thinking. You know, better safe than sorry, better that we exclude everybody because we can't really tell who the disloyal people might be. Same as Korematsu, what was happening during World War II. Same approach as during the Palmer Raids. And moving ahead a little to the 1950s, the McCarthy era, the Red Scare. But these are the Hollywood 10 where again, people's lives were upended because of this tremendous fear, this you know, emotional rather than rational fear, that perhaps these people were endangering us, and so better safe than sorry, better to you know, just have everybody prohibited from working. Uh, moving ahead after 9-11, of course, the dragnets were then out for Muslim Americans, and I want to tell you a little bit about Abdullah al-Kid, because he happened to be another client of Legal Learned, who we who just met before. So um, Abdullah was born in Kansas, in Wichita, and his name originally was Livoni T. Kid. Uh, his grandfather was a Pentecostal minister. And at some point, Livoni decided to convert to Islam and changed his name. So he was attending the University of Idaho, as you can see, and there's a picture of him in his football uniform. He was a really very successful football player on the Vandals. When 9-11 hit, uh, somebody at the FBI concluded that there might be a sleeper cell 
of um, radical you know, Muslim terrorists on the University of Idaho campus. And Abdullah was trying very hard to cooperate with the FBI by explaining Islam to them, but uh, they suspected him, um, and they ended up uh, arresting him. He was about to leave the country because he had a fellowship to study Islam in Saudi Arabia. And they arrested him and you know, dragged him all over the country and detained him. So um, League Alert brought a lawsuit on his behalf. And long story about what happened. If you want to know more about that story, you could read my book. Because what I wrote <laughs> in this book was the story of how a lot of the changes in law after 9-11 affected ordinary Americans. Now, there were really a lot of results to this dragnet thinking, better safe than sorry. Well, you know, not clear what benefits we got from a lot of our policies about detention, surveillance, etc. But it is very clear how a number of completely innocent people's lives were, in fact, upended by this kind of overblown reaction. I'll tell you one other story from the book just to give you a sense of you know, what these dragnets do. So on a kind of a more minimal level, uh, this young man is a, a person of Kashmiri descent. He's an American citizen. He lives in Brooklyn. And New York City, has anyone here ever ridden the New York City subways? OK, a lot of people in the subways. And you may have noticed, you may have come upon the NYPD has these tables where if you go into the subway and you have a backpack or other large bag, they might, quote, randomly search your backpack. And this was supposed to be an anti-terrorism measure. To me, you know, the odds of finding somebody who actually is a terrorist when there are millions of people coming into the subway, not very great. Plus, if you are a terrorist going into the subway with a bomb in your backpack and you see the NYPD there, what do you do? You go in a different entrance. So you know, I don't think that this is a very beneficial program, although it may in fact make people feel safer. But Jangir Sultan got a little upset with these, quote, random searches when he was stopped for the 21st time. So the ACLU lawyers working on his case hired a statistician who established that the odds of his being stopped that often in that period of time, if these searches were truly random and not some sort of profiling, were 1 in 165 million. Okay, so yeah, that's some of what the dragnets do on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we may think we're doing things that are random, but in fact, those are the dragnets. Okay, another form of the same kind of problem. This is Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Arizona. Who's heard of Sheriff Joe? Okay, his idea is you just stop anybody who looks Mexican and you find out whether or not they're an illegal immigrant and whether or not they're committing a crime. But you sort of assume that anybody who looks Hispanic might well be a criminal. Well, it took the ACLU several years of litigation to shut down Sheriff Joe in Arizona because that's unconstitutional. You can't do that kind of racial profile. But I'm very much afraid that Sheriff Joe's idea of let's suspect everybody guilt by association has now gone nationwide. And to me, you know, I would call that a form of terrorism. So um, the people who have ended up on the short end of equality and justice are not always voluntary immigrants. Sometimes people's ancestors were not voluntarily brought to this country. So the ACIU started early on working in racial justice and was involved in the Scottsboro cases, you know, long story. Those were the nine uh, African-American teenagers who were charged with raping two white women in an instance that the historians tell us almost certainly did not occur. And they were treated very unfairly, but you know, enough about that. So in addition to a very discriminatory racial justice system charging black men with new crimes that they hadn't committed, uh, if you've looked at the Equal Justice Institute reports run by Brian Stevenson, uh, they've been trying to document all the examples of lynching in America. They've now found 4,000 examples. And what you see in the background is a memorial that they're putting together, they're working on still, to commemorate the lynching victims. And this again, it's history. Who, who read that, that um, history in high school? that you know, there was all this lynching going in, not many people. So they're trying to recover that history. So if you're interested in, a lot of um, colleges and communities are interested these days in having a book that you all read together. So these are not my books, but I think two great examples of the connections of our criminal justice system with our history of racism are Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, where she draws one connection about how we use the criminal justice system to keep control over mostly black men. And Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, where he talks about the death penalty and his efforts to fight a racist, racist criminal justice system. Remarkable book and also a great read. So there's my book report. Uh, one of the things the ACLU does today, one of our priorities, has been fighting the mass incarceration system. You can see on this chart that uh, 
Although one in every 106 white men are incarcerated, one in every 15 black men of the same age are incarcerated. And we have had studies showing that that is not because black men commit more crimes, it's because they're more likely to be arrested. We had one report on marijuana arrests showing that if a black man and a white man commit exactly the same marijuana crime, the black man on national average is 3.7 times as likely to be arrested as the white man. And you know, that average breaks down differently in different parts of the country. I'm not sure what it is in, in Illinois or in Chicago, but you could look that up. Stop and frisk, same story. The top measurement there is the number of white people in New York City as compared to the number of black people. And the reverse chart underneath is the number of total of police stops of white people as opposed to black people. Completely disproportionate. Uh, similar uh, concerns have been existing in Chicago. This is from the ACLU of Illinois website. And I'm sure you know there's been a lot of um, work done on oversight of the Chicago police. Uh, not only in terms of stop and frisk, which is one thing the ACLU of Illinois has been involved in trying to work out, you know, how do we run a program better to do what we need to do without being unnecessarily discriminatory, but also involved with uh, use of force by police officers. Again, some use of force is legitimate, and some is a problem. So you can look at the ACLU of Illinois website for an example of the local version of that kind of oversight, as well as another major thing that the ACLU does is know your rights. And so this is one thing that you would find on the ACLU of Illinois um, website. What should I do if the police stop or arrest me? We also have similar Know Your Rights materials for what to do if you're stopped by immigration officials, which has to be updated every five minutes these days. But we have the Know Your Rights materials in something like 47 different languages. Because again, you know, a lot of different people have these problems, not only Muslims. So that's one prototype, the equality and justice work, making sure that people are treated similarly if in fact they are in a similar situation. The second kind of prototype that I want to tell you about briefly is our First Amendment work. This is about freedom. And the other thing that was going on in 1920 was that people were being prosecuted for exercising their freedom of speech. So here are demonstrations during World War I, which was not altogether popular. You can see some labor organizers, some women, some etc. Uh, a lot of people don't know that there were these criminal prosecutions. And here again, one of the first acts of the ACLU in 1921 is a pamphlet reporting on the state of free speech in the United States. Here's an example of the kind of case that took place. This is 1919, before the ACLU got to work in the courts. Charles Schenck had been prosecuted for um, advocating against the draft. His theory was that the draft was a form of involuntary servitude. And the draft during World War I was not that popular. But Schenck was actually criminally convicted for his advocacy on the idea that that was a threat to law and order and to the government. So Schenck was not the only one. And the ACLU started to try to litigate the First Amendment in the courts. Here's Anita Whitney in California, who was also uh, prosecuted for an exercise of freedom of speech. Angelo Herndon, a very interesting man, African-American labor organizer, who was convicted of the crime of insurrection because of his labor organizing and things that he said. Something that seems to us shocking today because due in part to the work of the ACLU over the years, the courts have been far more receptive to claims about First Amendment violations of you know, free speech than they have about claims of equality and inequality and injustice. Going ahead with the ACLU's First Amendment work, well, the ACLU hired Clarence Darrow to do the Scopes trial. That was the trial in Tennessee of the school teacher who was uh, violating a Tennessee state law by teaching the theories of Charles Darwin when Tennessee only wanted the biblical theory of creation to be taught. So that's an important First Amendment moment. Another is during World War II, where these girls, Marie and Gathy Barnett, were taught by their parents who were Jehovah's Witnesses that they were not allowed to salute the flag because that was like pledging to a graven idol. It was like um, pledging to the state instead of to their god. And they were told that it was a violation of their religious beliefs. And remarkably enough, in 1943, the Supreme Court upheld their claim and said they have a First Amendment right to decline to salute the flag. And Robert Jackson, who became the prosecutor at Nuremberg, the war crimes prosecutor, had this great quote, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional con constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. 
One other case I want to tell you about is Mary Beth Tinker and her brother John, who when they were um, students, wanted to wear black armbands to protest the war in Vietnam. They were concerned that they only heard about deaths of troops and they didn't hear about deaths of Vietnamese. You know, nobody was you know, feeling sorry for what was happening there. And they brought a lawsuit where in 1969, Again, the ACLU won this lawsuit for Mary Beth Tinker and her brother, and the court said, the majority said, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. Mary Beth Tinker, almost 50 years later, continues to be an activist. She is a pediatric nurse, she's a labor organizer, she's on the ACLU board in Washington, D.C., and she recently did what she called the Tinker Tour, where she got on the bus and went around to high schools talking to students about what they could do about bullying of other students, etc. So, our First Amendment work often means that we are representing people who want to say things, no matter what they are, even if they're you know, pro-American flag and, and you know, um, anti-ACLU or you know, pro-gay straight alliances, whatever it is, we try to be as content neutral as we can manage. And um, one other case I want to tell you about, which we lost, unfortunately, was on behalf of this young man, Joseph Frederick, from Alaska, who when the uh, Olympics flag was going by, he wanted to get on television. So he made this uh, banner where, <laughs> on which it says, Bomb Hits for Jesus. <laughs> what did that mean? It meant he wanted to be on television. <laughs> but he ended up being suspended from school because the school officials thought that this was a pro-drug message. And he was suspended, and the Supreme Court said, no, no First Amendment right to say that. You know, that's about drugs. Sometimes our First Amendment work requires us to be content neutral and represent people who are speaking and saying things that we really dislike. The Nazis in Skokie, the Westboro Baptist Church, and how wicked is that to go to the, the funerals of soldiers and tell their families that the reason their children have died is that the United States is not sufficiently homophobic and that the, the God is punishing us for that. So, uh, just a little bit more about freedom. Our work on behalf of reproductive freedom grew out of our defensive speech. Margaret Sanger used to be prosecuted when she would bring, uh, you know, she was trying to advertise her ideas for Planned Parenthood, and we represented Margaret Sanger in the 1930s. Moving on, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was one of my predecessors as general counsel of the ACLU. You know about her. She started the Women's Rights Project in the 1960s, and since then we've had a lot of reproductive freedom work to, to be done. Um, here's, you can't read the whole charts here, but look at the ACLU website if you want to see. This is a sample of the anti-abortion bills currently pending before state legislatures. You would have thought we won that in Roe v. Wade. Not the case. There are all these states that are chipping away and trying to move backwards. Marriage, another example of connect the dots. Mildred and Richard Loving, anyone see the recent film, which is great, from Ruth Nega with her ACLU button at the Oscars, which is great. <laughs> uh, it wasn't until 1967 that the Supreme Court held that you can't deny people the right to marry who they want, regardless of their races. And Mildred Loving would have been the first to tell you that therefore you should also let two men or two women get married if they'd like to. 1972 was the first attempt of the ACLU of Minnesota to bring a lawsuit on behalf of these two men that they had a right to get married. We didn't win that at the time, but we did win the case on behalf of Edie Windsor, and then the big one, the Obergefell versus Hodges case, uh, where the Supreme Court ruled that you have the right to marry who you love. And look at the connect the dots, the, the progress from loving to Obergefell. The final thing I'll mention to you before we um, go to question and answer, and then you can tell me what you'd like to talk about, is one of our current issues is about uh, trans people, you know, part of our LGBT work. And this is the, the North Carolina Bathroom Act that they have there. Um, so you may have read quite recently that the Supreme Court had a case which they just decided not to hear on behalf of Gavin Grimm. Now this case was originally filed as GG because Gavin Grimm would rather not be famous. He just wanted to go to the bathroom. But his school in Virginia would not let him go to the boys' room because on his birth certificate it says he's a girl. And he therefore was told that he was required to go to the girls' room even though he identifies and looks like a boy. So, um, what happened was that uh, Gavin did pretty well because the Department of Justice and Department of Education issued a guidance to all schools saying that under Title IX, the statute in the Civil Rights Act, 
that uh, prohibits sex discrimination. They held that what had happened to Gavin was a form of sex discrimination and that the school had to make available to him a bathroom that corresponded to his actual sexuality. Well, you may have heard that the Trump administration has now revoked that guidance, and so what has happened more recently is that the Supreme Court has now decided that they can't hear the case yet because they don't know what the impact is of the departments revoking that guidance. Now they're going to have to decide eventually whether Title IX actually protects Gavin Grimm or whether he has any constitutional rights. Uh, okay, so I've given you a very brief guided tour of ACLU history uh, of the challenges that we've had with respect to equality and justice as well as freedom. There are also a lot of other areas that you saw on the list where we work, uh, including voting rights, um, disability rights, uh, religion, human rights, etc. So I'm happy to be talking about any of those during the question and answer. But I thought that a nice place to end might be with a uh, poem to end my formal part of the speech. A poem that I've only recently discovered, even though it was written in 1935 by Langston Hughes. And with all the talk about America be, uh, make America great again, Langston Hughes' poem is called Let America Be America Again. Remarkable? So here's just some excerpts. The whole thing is well worth reading. Hughes says, let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. Parens, America never was America to me. I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never yet has been, and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring our mighty dream again. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, and yet, I swear this oath, America will be. Thank you. Don't be shy, we believe in freedom of speech. Oh, there's a nice microphone in the middle, so your question can be heard. And if you could do us all the favor of identifying yourself before asking your question. Bob Sloan, a professor in Department Head for Computer Science. Uh, let me uh, ask something uh, primarily concerning criminal law and also a speech uh, here and whether you were involved. It's a uh, young engineering student named Jabari Bean who was outraged by the Laquan McDonald incident here in Chicago and who tremendously, unfortunately, briefly posted and then retracted uh, on a social, I think, gaming website, a uh, threat uh, to go and shoot up uh, University of Chicago students. Um, the University of Chicago was closed for a day, the FBI was involved. Um, eventually, uh, federal charges were dropped. Um, we um, kicked him out like that. Um, so, and the question, uh, our one, uh, was the ACLU involved? with uh, Jabari Dean, and two, uh, what are your thoughts on the incident? Okay, so I'm telling you, are you a public or private university? We are a public, public university. Public university, okay, then the First Amendment applies. One thing that a lot and of people And he was on realize, campus not using any university resources. Okay, so that's complicated too. So one thing that people don't often get is that if you don't work for a public university, some part of the state, the First Amendment only applies to state entities, governmental entities, state, local, federal. So if you're in a private school, the First Amendment doesn't apply, which is first we have to narrow down, is there a First Amendment issue? So there is a First Amendment issue. The ACLU has been involved in cases all over the country of students, usually at lower levels, at high school levels, who are punished for things that they say on computers that are not connected with the school. They criticize a teacher, they argue in favor of a gay-straight alliance, and they find, them, find themselves you know, punished in school. So we've certainly been involved in those cases. We think that students should have a right to exercise their freedom of speech. 
Now what you're talking about is something that could well be on the other side of the line. Because even people who ardently believe in free speech also accept the fact that sometimes there are places where you, know, you can't yell fire in the crowded theater. So if in fact you have a particular instance where people are really doing things that are inciting violence, that the First Amendment does not cover. So, you know, I, first of all, I don't personally know enough about the case to tell you which side I think this would come down on. You know, there are some cases where you would say that's fine and some where you wouldn't. I, and I also can't tell you whether or not the ACLU is involved because we have 50 affiliates around the country and, you know, hundreds of lawyers and um, I sometimes have the view from 30,000 feet. So we would have to talk longer about the facts about which side of the First Amendment line that was on. And then we would also have to talk about the fact that, as you can see from these days, there are so many possibilities for what ACLU offices might do that there are a lot of resource questions about who you're going to represent. So even if you think that somebody has been treated in a way that violates their civil liberties, it is not always the case that an ACLU affiliate is going to have the bandwidth to be able to do something about that or prioritize that particular case. So I know those are not you know, complete answers, but you know, the particular case, I don't know, we could look it up. Right. That's what Google is good for. Mm -hmm. uh, let me actually, since you're in computer sciences, let me tell you one other interesting story because this is just sort of about how the ACLU works. So you all know we do litigation and we do a lot of public education. But one of the things that I haven't mentioned yet, one of our areas that comes within uh, speech, privacy, and technology in the middle there, is surveillance. So we, they're doing a lot of that surveillance. So in addition to all the lawsuits that we brought and all the lobbying against the Patriot Act and all that kind of thing, Somebody had the very clever idea to hire a person who's called an internet interface technologist, I think it is. And what he does is he works with, within the industry on their code to protect privacy. And his analogy to those of us who don't know anything about computers is it's sort of like if you want to prevent people from dying on a highway, there are two things you can do. One is to say there's a speed limit that go beyond this speed. And another is you could make shoulders on the road and just you know, ways to just keep people safe that are baked right in. So the idea of this is, can we just bake in privacy to the internet? So I don't know if you're familiar with that campaign at all, but I just thought you know, it would be interesting in terms of the different kinds of things that, that you can do. Um, what else? I have a yes or no question I can ask from right here. Did you bring any merchandise? <laughs> what merchandise? Oh, yeah, we have lots of merchandise. There's now an ACLU store uh, online, which you can easily find. I mean, here today. Oh, here, oh, did I bring her to you guys? No, I didn't. Um, in fact, I told the ACLU of Illinois people that I would be here, but you know, with all this stuff going on with the federal government and all, I can tell you that most ACLU staff these days are literally thousands of emails behind. So you know, I, I think ordin under ordinary circumstances, the affiliate would have been here with a table with lots of merchandise. But under the circumstances, there are thousands of emails behind. So I think they were assuming that being at a university here, you were all smart enough to find the merchandise for yourself. <laughs> okay, so can you remember these letters? ACLU.org. <laughs> okay, you want to know what we're doing? You don't need the paper brochure anymore. Right? What would you have done with that? You probably would have thrown it away anyway. So you can go to the website of ACLU.org and or the ACLU of Illinois, and you can see what the affiliate is doing. And we now have this great store which fortunately, unfortunately, has been out of us of the merchandise lately because everybody now wants their ACLU t-shirts and caps and, you know, and all sorts of things. So, you know, look at the ACLU shop make great presents. Um, some of you may be familiar with, anybody watch the Oscars? Okay, so Ruth Mega, who was in the Loving film, and Lin-Manuel Miranda, other people wore their ACLU blue ribbons, which I thought was really cool. So guess what, after that we ran out of blue ribbons. <laughs> so they're making some more, we should have more of those by the end of the month if you want to have a blue ribbon wearing party. Right? I'm an ACLU ribbon wearing member. And the other thing I can tell you about the blue ribbons is that the last little bit of the supply that they had of those beforehand was used when the president gave his address to the joint session of Congress and Senator Elizabeth Warren and several other members of Congress wore their ACLU blue ribbons to that session, which I thought was very cool. So yes, there's lots of, lots of merchandise, but you're going to have to click to get it, as opposed to being able to get it right outside. I apologize, but what can you do? We're so popular these days <laughs> for, for all the right reasons. Yes. Uh, yes, hi. I'm Amalia Payares. I'm Director of Latin American and Latino Studies, and I'm also on a task force that I was poster and it's just charged for dealing with our students and um, around immigration issues. Yeah. Um, and so the question of the moment for me, given the new order yesterday, 
is um, what is the ACLU thinking in terms of how it's going to respond? Okay, so I'll tell you, I can imagine, I can, I'm sure I can tell you that at this very minute while I'm speaking, there are people working on that. Uh, so one of the big questions is, is the new order different enough? So what uh, the government has done in the new executive order just issued yesterday, today's Tuesday, right? So that's yesterday. Uh, they kind of took away some of the things that were most blatantly unconstitutional. So they've now exempted legal permanent res residents. They've exempted people who already have a visa. And they've also reduced you know, the countries by, by one. So on the face of the order, it's not as obvious a denial of due process because they've taken the people who obviously had a right to due process and they've left them out. They've also left out, they said, never mind about the religious exception. There was an exception for minority religions, but only if they were Christians. <laughs> and you know, the president kind of said, this is what we have in mind. We meant this to be a Muslim ban and we came as close as we could while still trying to be constitutional. So this is now a much harder order to be able to challenge in court. It's now less clear. You know, most of the courts, everybody except one judge, looked at the original order and said, too broad, unconstitutional, violates the due process clause, violates the First Amendment. At least you know, there's a good chance that it would be found to over time. And now what we're down to is in litigating this, we are going to have to convince the court that it matters what the origin of the new act was. That regardless of what it says, that it's still a Muslim ban. And if you look at you know, the blog post that you know, the first communications person got up about this, um, he said the best approach to um, a no Muslim ban is not to have a Muslim ban. <laughs> so you know, that would have been our brother, it's just you know, none of the above. But it, it's difficult now, so I think that you know, we will continue to litigate whatever can be litigated. But I think we also need you know, the kinds of alliances that I was talking about before. One thing that civil libertarians say, if you were shocked by any of the pictures of the Nazis in Skokie or the Westboro Baptist Church or you know, the whatever t-shirts uh, students were wearing to school, the classic civil libertarian line is that the best antidote to bad speech is more speech. That you get people to talk more and we hope that you know, tr the truth will come out out of conversation as opposed to saying to people, you can't say that, it's too hateful. So I was thinking the other day that I feel like Maybe the best antidote to all this attempt to incite religious antipathy, to kind of get us at each other's throats, we should be suspicious of the Muslims, we should be suspicious of the Mexicans, not just religion, but ethnicity, we should be suspicious of. I think the best antidote to that is unity. You know, to look across religious, ethnic, racial lines, and to really just all come together. And that's why I started with what I think are incredible examples of people really rising up and saying, no, we're not going to let ourselves be polarized like that. So I think that, you know, I, I've always, I was talk to, talking to some individual student <coughs> activists before this, and I thought it was really interesting how people coming from different perspectives were really seeing opportunities to have coalitions and networks. So, you know, it's like you know, the Latino students have their own interests in a way, but they're not just their own interests. They're also everybody else's interests. So I think that the whole idea of yeah, giving, having religion rise to, one thing I left out in, the, in terms of fighting the Muslim ban was that there were hundreds of evangelical Christian churches and pastors who rose up and signed petitions and bought an ad, I've seen one in the Washington Post saying, no, you know, this is not who we are. You know, don't do this to favor Christians because we don't like it. This is not what our religion is about. So I think you know, that's what we should be doing in addition to litigation, which is only gonna have you know, limited utility. You know, the president has a lot of power. And I think people are looking to the ACLU to make everything all better. But you know, we can't sweep away all this with our broom. You know, there are going to be things that the president has power to do. And I think that the more important thing right now, even than litigating, is to create the foundation for a more equal and just country, the country that Langston Hughes is looking for that kind of never was yet, but should be. So I'll tell you one more thing if you want to look at what we're doing and what you could do. Is, uh, we just started a, a part of a, a new campaign called People Power. And the idea there is to mobilize the incredible outpouring that we've had of people who want to volunteer and want to help. So instead of just saying, okay, you know, send us money and we'll do it. The ACLU staff, even if we staff up, is not the answer at this point. We need to really mobilize those networks. So if you're interested, on March the 11th, there's going to be the first live stream of the first uh, program of the People's Power Program, which is called Resistance Training. It's going to physically take place in Miami but people all around the country have been invited to host a session where people can get together and watch the live stream and begin to mobilize themselves to do resistance training. 
So, so far there have been, last time I looked, it was over 80,000 people had kind of agreed to be a part of that program. And you know, maybe somebody here would like to arrange a room where you live stream it and people who are interested could get together. So I think the people power idea, what can people do? You know, when should you be demonstrating out in the street? What are the petitions you should be signing? Who are the politicians who you should be writing to when something happens to express your point of view or what you think is wrong? I think we really need organization. And what I think is great is that we have some great leadership right now on the ACLU, and they're trying to rise to that occasion right now. We're not only going to litigate, what we're also going to do, because I think it just needs to be done, is to try to mobilize people who don't like what's happening and who want to say, don't let this happen here, and to give all of you and people you know some way to try to fight back. And thank you, thank you for doing what you do. So how are we doing? Do we have time for one more question? Or? Okay, who wants the last question? Hi, uh, my name is Marco. Uh, I'm a uh, student here at USC. Uh, I'm studying engineering. Um, just as more as a follow-up question to uh, what you were just discussing right now, uh, as far as the, uh, the immigration ban. Um, so, a lot, uh, from what I've read anyway in the news lately, uh, as far as the legislation that's been going around, it's all been through executive orders from Donald Trump. So I, I guess my question is, how much power does he actually have? Like I, I don't. Yeah. I don't remember learning in high school how much right. power he actually has. <laughs> I think because that's a really hard question, and that's certainly something that we're going to keep our eye on. Uh, I am in, next month. I've been invited to speak on a panel at the National Constitution Center, which they're going to live stream, where they have all sorts of people. Uh, and my panel is exactly on that issue. What about presidential power? Now, uh, the ACLU has sometimes argued that the president has enough power to do something by executive order. We supported President Obama's executive order creating the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, where people who had been brought into this country by undocumented parents, uh, when they were you know, undocumented themselves, were given a, um, some security that they would be able to stay, that they wouldn't be deported, because we believe that deportation and, and kind of prosecutorial discretion is a traditional executive function. That's something that presidents can do. On the other hand, we have in the past opposed presidents sending troops abroad to engage in hostilities when Congress has not authorized sending troops or declared war because we think that the war powers are supposed to be split. So our answer to how much power does the president have is contextual. And I can assure you that in response to the earlier question of what are we doing about the new Muslim ban, is I can assure you that one um, argument that's being looked at in cases like who gets to decide how many refugees come into the country. We're looking at the case law on what does the president get to decide by himself and where does the president really have to have authorization by Congress. Some things kind of take care of themselves. There are two other executive orders about immigration, one of which is the domestic enforcement, which is sort of bringing Sheriff Joe Arpaio's program, loosely speaking, to the whole country, you know, just you know, having people arrested in raids of their homes and workplaces. But the third one of January 25th was let's build a great big wall well, President Trump can't build a great big wall by himself because he needs the budget to do that. And it's Congress that has to decide the budget. We know he can't do that. So what you're asking is like a really big question about you know, where well, does Congress have to actually stand up and say we agree? And where can the president just say let it be done? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the, the worst uh, uh, instance in history that I recall the president kind of overstepping a lot of bounds was with uh, President Jackson, and I don't, I don't know what allowed him to do a lot of the things that he did. I don't know if it was yeah. uh, just a lot of kind of just Congress kind of just giving him the benefit of the doubt because they were the same party, kind of like yeah. the way it is right now. So that's, I, I guess I have a little bit more worry because of the fact that all the branches right now are controlled by one, one party. Well, I, I think you also have appropriate worries in terms of uh, President Trump has, in the background of a lot of photos you see in his office, he has a, photo, a portrait of Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. And in terms of one of the things that I thought was great about the initial response to the Muslim ban is not just that the ACLU challenged it in court, but that our judges, federal judges, who have some political independence, were able to say, no, you know, nobody is above the law, not even the president. He may think he can do this, but he's not a dictator. He's subject to the Constitution. They did that. What happened when, um, however, you, you need some, you, the courts need backup, and that's why I think you're right to be concerned. So do you know about the, uh, the Trail of Tears 
yeah. what happened to the Cherokees. Okay, so there's an example that whether Georgia had the power to kick out the Cherokees went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in their favor. And there's a, an apocryphal statement that's attributed to Jackson that he probably didn't say exactly, well, let John Marshall enforce his opinion. But Andrew Jackson did nothing to enforce that opinion. And so despite the Supreme Court order that Georgia did not have power to kick out the Cherokees, they kicked out the Cherokees. And that led to the Trail of Tears. So it's a complex issue because it's, it's not even what does the president have power to do, but what's, what does the president have the power not to do? And what they're doing right now is they're withdrawing the Department of Justice, which used to be our partner on voting rights work, um, you know, the Gavin Grimm case and things like that. So it's a very complicated picture and I couldn't agree more, you know, it's very concerning. So I'm ending up here with social media. Here's all the ways that you can follow us in addition to going on ACLU.org and looking at the shop and everything else. So thank you all for being here today. I appreciate the fact that you all came. And I'm taking that to mean that you share some concern about where we are now and what's happening, and that you want to be part of the solution. So thank you for that.